everybody can hear and everything. All right. Okay, I think we're good. It's a cool uh, setup think, you got there. Yeah, it's actually cool. It's OBS. It allows us to go ahead and do Zoom, and then I'm able to broadcast live out to Facebook. So we're oh, actually broadcasting cool. not just in Iowa Film, but we're also broadcasting to Nebraska Film, South Dakota Film, and Shelby's Feminist Film Group. So we're broadcasting in a whole bunch of places. So there may be a lot of viewers. <laughs> okay, cool. That sounds great. But anyway, uh, for people who don't know, um, I don't know Alex at all. Um, I've been a really big fan for a long time. And uh, I went ahead and took a shot and knew somebody who knew Alex and said, hey, I think I know his email address. And I sent an email just out of the blue and said, I'm a big fan. Um, we'd love to talk to you on Iowa film. And Alex was such a gracious guy. He just not knowing me at all, completely just agreed to do this. Oh yeah. Well, young filmmakers are, it's very, it's always fun to, to talk with them and to hear what you guys are doing. Basically, I, I hope that at whatever that you take from this at the end of it, you basically just feel more encouraged to have the confidence to step into it because everybody, even at, you know, I call my idols and ask them for advice. I mean, I did just days ago to be like, what, okay, how are you handling this particular situation? How, you know, and you know, the, 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 the more gracious the, the filmmakers are, the, the better the films are. So like, you know, the people that are the Academy award-winning type people, you call them and they're just as down to earth and they're acting no differently than, you know, you are if you're 18 and, you know, trying to make your film as good as you can. It's uh, so it's, it uh, should be an open conversation to everybody and uh, they should feel encouraged and not feel intimidated by filmmaking or anything that lays before them. Well, that brings me kind of to an interesting thing. I, I was doing a little background and it said that you went to Austin to school. Is that true? Did you go to film school yep. in Austin? Lawrence. <laughs> well, Shelby's, yeah. Shelby's applying to Austin. To, yeah. to the film school there. We've been talking to Cindy McCready over there, trying oh, yeah. to get Shelby into the film school there. Oh, that's so, cool. Yeah. yeah, no, Austin's a great place. And it's a, it's, it's a great place to make films because there's other people that, um, that are wanting to make films and contribute to films. And unlike Los Angeles, there's just a general vibe where it's like, hey, what are you working on? And you, could, you may tell you whatever you're working on, you explain your idea and people are like, that sounds like shit, you know, like they want you to make something good, you know, whereas here it's like, you could be like, hey man, I got a gig. It's not great, but yeah, you know, I'm shooting an exercise video for this company and people are like, that's awesome. You're working, man. That's great. Like, <laughs> what kinds of quality? It's just like, are you surviving or not? And so mm -hmm. it's very, it's great to be in a film community where you, you're watching old films, you're in your th rethinking things and you, you have that youthful chip on your shoulder where you're like, that's bullshit. You know, I think that's important to to try to maintain, you know. And and for me, I love. I mean, I call my producer friends, and they're talking with their eighteen year old kids to say, "What do you think about so and so? What do you?" And I love their opinions because they they have so. I mean, you guys, when you're young, you have such strong opinions. <laughs> and it's fantastic to hear. Um, and your your worldview is so different. So it's you know I'm forty four now. And it's incredible to my, your experience of watching moving images and how you communicate is different. Um, and that's very powerful because you're, you're tapped into a way of communicating with people. It, you know, every film is an audience, is a communication with an audience. And oftentimes that's a, in, in my, when my idols were showing them at films, at film festivals, getting them into art house cinemas. That's how I grew up watching them and loving them and wanting to you know be part of that conversation where an audience watches it and then they respond they like it you talk with your friends and you debate it and you say that movie's great this movie's shit and so on and that's like the whole event is really fun but the whole medium has changed to such a degree that you're experiencing uh that conversation differently and it's uh, so i love hearing young people's perspectives on uh on acting, it could be anything. Like, how are you? How are you consuming your media? Mm -hmm. um, and so the conversation is wide open, and it, it's 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 yours for the taking, because mm -hmm. uh, you know the the older filmmakers are 
functioning in a different world as well. Sure. So uh, it, it's a, it, you're at a unique precipice and uh, yeah, so I- I would agree with that. You know, I, I, I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about some of your stuff, Alex. I, I, I was really um, introduced to you blindly because I remember watching um, Independent Spirit Awards and I was looking through it and I had somebody tell me, I said, you've got it, you've got to see this movie. Um, and when I heard about In Search of a Midnight Kiss, it was, I had just seen the trailer. It was black and white. It was the first trailer that was black and white only. And I yeah. kind of looked at it and I thought, oh, it's like a little Truffaut nod, which was not quite what it is, you know? Um, but I mean, in some respects probably, but I mean, I kind of yeah. saw it and I thought, I thought, okay, whatever. I, gonna, you know. I think Lord of Blows is actually on the shelf. Ah! Oh, is it? <laughs> I love that movie. That was definitely an influence for that movie. Was it? So it wasn't just yeah. me? It wasn't just no, me? No, okay. because they're shooting on the streets. They're, they, it's, yeah. I mean, and so they're using what they have and what they think is cool and what they know. The, their, you know, that French wave, they're looking at the older filmmakers saying that they're, they're not being realistic and they're not reflecting life, you know, and that's what it's about. It's that, that conversation was more fresh. And so they're saying, we can do things that they can't. We can put it in the car and go down the street. We can film yeah. on local streets and not in sets um, and tell a story that means something to them. Uh, and, and so, yeah, and the music is so beautiful. Oh my God. And so they, there was such a great mix of, uh, and it, an appreciation for the older uh, way films were made, but still that 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 edge that a young person has that wants to tell their own story. Mm -hmm. uh, I, so I love that awesome. movie so much. And, and I've been teaching it for a long time in my classes. Um, as a matter of fact, um, Shelby's one of my students, you know, at the Hot Attic Film School. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, I have, you know, th there, I have several students watching that aren't necessarily here interacting, but... It's a you're in search of a midnight kiss. I've taught it for quite some time for a lot of reasons. One about budget and that you can do mm -hmm. fantastic work. I've never seen a film with that small a budget when the Casavetes. I, I I remember when you won. I was like, are you kidding? That this film made for so little won the Casavetes. And I went back through today and I looked at all the you know all the interviews and stuff that went with that film that are still available. Mm -hmm. And um, I have to admit, I'm absolutely, totally in love with Sarah Simmons. Yeah. Oh, my God. Holy yeah. cow. Fantastic. Yeah. And I went back and looked at this and they talked about the casting and they said, well, we're just friends making movies. Yeah. And I just wanted your perspective on that friends making movies. Well, all, OK, you guys are all at a young age where you're the people that you're meeting and you're collaborating with you're likely going to collaborate with you know 10 or 20 years from now I mean and that, and that goes for every you know Wes Anderson um, you know met his uh, Owen Wilson at film school you know it, it's not an accident <laughs> it's just you're at that age where you you're meeting other young people that want to tell cool stuff and something catches your eye about your friend you're like oh that's this guy's funny or this this actress is really interesting um, yeah, Sarah and Scoot and I had made two films previously. Uh, so that was our third film together. Uh, and, and Brian McGuire too. And even, um, so, uh, yeah. And, and, the, and the guy who's the DP, Robert Murphy, he's also the crazy uh, redneck in the film. And we had, we had made- <laughs> I didn't realize that. <laughs> yeah, so it was great. Cause he's shooting the whole film. And then that was his chance <laughs> like, hey, get, get in front of the- uh, go get in the front and start acting. And he just like let loose. Everybody was, uh, um, you know, was blown away. But, you know, even it was like Robert's performance is a good example of the things that you're working on now, uh, wh whether it's a short film or a, a feature film that fails, it's part, it will, you, it, you stick with it. Because for example, that character is named Jack Mo, um, was part of a feature film that that, that uh, RDP, Robert Murphy, uh, was making previously. And he shot on 16 millimeter film. So this is when I was learning, we first met, he's shooting on 16, super inspired by Quentin Tarantino at the time. So this is like 1998 and shooting a hugely complicated story. 
five different stories that are all intertwined, shooting on 16 at night out in the middle of the forest, all the things that you pull your hair out to say don't do because it's a, it's a pain in the ass uh, and you'll sacrifice other things. But he was ambitious and, and the movie has really great Robert Altman type moments and then other parts, that it just never came together as a whole. He finished it, but it just didn't have quite it didn't land as much as he wanted to. So it didn't get quite the uh, appreciation, but it was, uh, there were such great moments and it was such a big influence on me. And he played a very similar character. And so, uh, so when we had the time three movies later to make, uh, you know, we had this crazy boyfriend, it's like, okay, you're playing Jack Mo. you know, so we're bringing back a character that he was creating in a film uh, probably 10 years before that, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, that's just to say, everything you're doing, it, it builds, you know, and, and things that don't work out, they end up twisting into a whole other version later on. I mean, Robert Rodriguez was a big influence when I was young in that he was so practical about the way he talked about filmmaking. His 15 minute film school book was like, it felt so exciting when you're, you're like, oh, I could do this. And you're like, his whole attitude was do it with your friends. Don't think it's screwing around when you're even just shooting in camera, cut, moving, okay, now going and you get to know your camera so you don't even have to go back and edit out the word cut. <laughs> when you're doing that, you're learning the language of filmmaking and you're practicing and you're in stuff that cracks you up and brings you to tears with your friends will turn into something more polished later. Um, but it's that, the freedom you have with you and your friends to take those chances. Um, it's it's that is the process and so i know it's there's a lot of uh, uncertainty and there's a lot of you know crisis of confidence um and parents that are not understanding of what the hell are you doing and why are you focusing on this what a waste um <laughs> that's all just part of it for everybody i mean when when i was cutting my second feature uh, I had Sandra Adair, who she had cut all of Richard Linklater's films, and she was editing my second feature. And uh, and she was uh, she was talking with she was at that point they just started shooting School of Rock, or they they were just at that point doing School of Rock, and uh, and she was talking with her parents. Now they've made all these great films, and she's talking with her mom. And she's like, "Well, when are you going to make a real film?" <laughs> and that's like you know that's that's you got to think and you know she's gone on to you know be nominated for academy awards and they sure. you know and so on but that was so deep into her career you know and she's still having that conversation which is just like you know of course to a young person you're like those are the real films not the you know the, the hollywood stuff that's not that interesting and so right. um that's just to say you have to Take it in the take it on the chin, and stick you know have uh, stick with it. Engage with your friends. Take those chances. Um, yeah. So th by that I mean you're you're, you're going to uh, cast your friends. You're going to find people that you think are interesting because your friends will stick with it. Because the best thing about your film is going to be lots of takes, doing way too many takes. That's you either have time or you have money. And so if you have money, you can pay people to stay around for longer and do more takes. Mm -hmm. If you have friends that are hungry and have that like scoop, when I met him, he had never acted in a film in his life. He was really? cutting trees. And I was casting my first feature. Um, it's a comedy called Wrong Numbers. It's about two guys trying to buy beer over the course of one night and just having like the hell of a night. We made this in 1998, it took us four years. I was waiting tables, delivering chicken, shooting on the weekends with my friends. Um, and then, yeah, and he was cutting trees. I, I just had an open open auditions and I was going on for months. And then he, uh, he came in, never acted in before. My friend Robert, crazy Robert Murphy, who was a, a Jack Mother guy, that DP, he just like, you know, I'm going to print out a piece of paper and, and start teaching acting classes. That's literally it. Scoot sees this piece of paper while goes in, takes the, you know, starts like going into some acting class. And it's a crazy acting class where Robert is like literally having like a 65 year old guy reading <clears throat> Pulp Fiction scenes with an eight year old. And it, so, you know, it's crazy. He's really funny and terrific spirit. Scoot is in there. 
doesn't know anything about acting. And I'm, I, I go to Robert, I'm like, hey, is there anybody I'm, I'm auditioning? He's like, yeah, there's one guy that's uh, 18. I went in the back of the class, we did some scenes, and I was like, that's it. He's the lead. He didn't know what he was doing. He never even read the script. We shot a full feature. He never read the script. I would just give him his sides each day. He was too lazy. He didn't care at that point. It wasn't like, <laughs> you know, it wasn't like something you were going to seriously do. It's like, all right, give me the thing. All right, I'll do it. You know, right. and we just start filming. And um, and but it went on. It went on for a long time. And so it's four years. So like, you got to think how good your friends are because you're going to show up and be like, hey man, we got all right. We're going to go down to the corner. And we're going to be filming this such and such thing. And it, and it just goes on and on like that. And um, so your friends who, you know, and you have to give them little things that make them feel like it's going to work out. So you got to show them some stuff. And it's but so funny. That's, that's like, you know, my story, that's, you know, we went on to make those and now Scoots and every other Netflix show. And mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, but that's just to say you're going to meet the people and, and, and just treat everyone with total respect, you have no idea. I mean, there's a, there's talent everywhere. There's talent when you walk into a convenience store, you could end up seeing the next whatever, you know. <laughs> They're everywhere. And so you're gonna just find it and you're gonna find someone that wants sure. it as much as you. You know, I, yesterday, last night, I, I knew we were gonna do this. I watched Meet Me in Montenegro last night, I took a bunch of notes. A yellow pad watch, I sit with kind of a yellow pad and take notes as I watch, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. A yellow pad watch. And, um, of course I'd watched in search of a midnight kiss. Actually, I know both Ben and Shelby had not seen it till just very, very recently. Oh, yeah, and, cool. and one of the things uh, about the writing in that film is that it really, it, it really struck me is a really profoundly written film. I, I, I remember watching it and thinking about the voice in that film, especially at that time, there weren't, other films that had a voice like that. And yeah. I think that's, and then, and then when you go back and you look at, I mean, th there were some major, I mean, <laughs> it's really funny. I was looking at it and I was going through the awards on, on that film and it's crazy. It's like best feature at Edinburgh winner, Florida. I mean, it's like, I mean, the awards, it, it, that film did incredible things. I mean, looking at it, yeah. it, it was, it was really amazing. And then I went back and saw some of the top film critics in the country reviewed that film and every one of them said the writing was really strong in it. Mm -hmm. So I'm just really kind of curious too about, you know, I mean, I talk about, you know, I always think of myself as a writer first, you know, even though I'm a professor, you know, you, yeah. you always think of yourself as a writer, but I mean, I think, you know, I, I'm just kind of curious about, you know, maybe where the concept came from and maybe yeah. a little bit of your process in the writing. Yeah. I mean, that one is, was, you know, written traditionally. So, um, yeah, I, I had uh, been, yeah, I, I had been creating a long document just about my experiences in Los Angeles, which I loathed. And I had this document and it was called, if LA fell into the ocean, I wouldn't miss it. <laughs> <laughs> that, so I'd been working on just little tidbits and it was just about how horrible it is to live in Los Angeles and how demoralizing it is. and. Um, yeah, and I was really heartbroken at the time, and I had had gone through a big breakup, and I didn't, I never intended to move to Los Angeles. I thought it was just a three month stay, but all that stuff really happened. I crashed my car on the way out there, it rolled over. Um, oh, you can wow. actually see on the in the image for in I mean, I guess that's my car on my drive to oh Los Angeles, God. from Austin. Oh, wow, and you can see all my stuff scattered about, and, and there's a poster for wrong numbers, and the reason. I was even going to Los Angeles is because we showed wrong numbers. That was the first feature we made at a film festival. And, and it's really, really rough because I didn't know what I was doing, but it's, I, I still love the film. I love it. It hasn't been released. I'm going to upload it on YouTube at some point because it's, it's super bad basically. Um, but it's, it's funny. It's really rough, but it's got heart. Um, and we showed it at a film festival and there was basically all these Hollywood people there that were like, holy shit, this is a complete slam dunk Hollywood remake. Um, Cause it's a comedy about two guys trying to buy beer and it just had a really strong connection with the audience. So I started, um, 
I like walked out of that. Literally, at that it was that moment. I by the time I got to my apartment, which was about thirty minutes away, walking, I had calls from every. It was like this is so and so from Miramax. This is so and so from blah blah blah, because the right people were in the room and just saw the reaction. I ended up meeting up with this writer who was there. Her name is Jessica Bendinger. She wrote Bring It On, uh, that cheerleading movie, which is just a mass success. But we met her actually at the Austin Film Festival. Scoot, um, <laughs> Jessica is really a great writer, but she was also really beautiful. She was like a model before she went to Ivy League school and then became a writer. She's just one of these people that's like has everything going for her. But I didn't know that. It was just like, you know, I was at that point like 22 and it was just like, oh, there's a pretty woman. Okay. I'm like, hey, Scoot, go talk to that pretty woman and ask her to come to our show. And it ended up being Jessica Bindinger. And she was, she's super smart and super cynical. And she's like, okay, I'll go, but if I'll give it five minutes. If it sucks, I'm out. <laughs> and she came, she loved it. And then she ended up saying, she's like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna meet. So we ended up, I ended up going with her, me and uh, Sam Merrick, who I wrote it with went to Los Angeles and we ended up meeting up with a uh, pitching or uh, remake to Red Wagon, who, which is this big company at Sony who had just made Gladiator and Girl Interrupted, which won the best picture the year before. So they were like really hot producers. And, you know, we're just young kids that have this like movie about guys trying to buy beer. And uh, they were like, we want to do it with you. And so we started doing a, a pitch for a remake. And so I was going back um, because we pitched to a bunch of people at Sony and so on, and they passed. And all these people were like, mm, I don't think getting beer is that hard. And I was like, you're too old. You forgot. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Um, and so, but there was interest. So they wanted to do a rewrite, but I had been showing it at the Alamo. See, the Alamo Draft House, which now is a big thing, back then was just like a punk rock venue. Yeah. So Tim and Carey who started the... Um, started the uh alamo they just rented the upstairs of this place in Austin, downtown austin that was like nobody was using and they started showing movies and showing beer and showing cool stuff and so it had this like curatorial aspect but also this punk rock vibe so when you're watching movies it felt alive you know like it's not just some you know you're just sitting there and watching oh the dardan brothers oh it makes me you know like i can say that it makes me sound intellectual you know, like them or not it's like it had a punch you in the face you know reality to it the way that tim curates it it wasn't just an intellectual exercise it was everything like so they would show new real new italian new realistic films and and then they would show you uh you know Did, movies from the 70s and, and it was was, so was weird wednesday a thing back then yeah, weird wednesday was uh. awesome you would well sometimes it was terrible but you would get ideas and you would see you know, B movie schlock or oh. whatever. Um, and Quentin Tarantino started coming and loving it and showing like his movies because he has 35 millimeter prints. So mm -hmm. then it, it just became really fun. But back then it was just a, it was just a room upstairs. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I talked with Tim and I'm like, hey man, I got this movie we made. Can I show it at your, uh, at your theater on like a Tuesday night? And he's, I mean, it's like being in a band, you know, where he's like, all right, Sure, you know, thinking, okay, you'll ask all your friends and pack the theater for one night and I'll sell some beer. That's it, you know? And so we showed it and it sold out. And it was like, he's like, all right, pretty good job. And so then uh, he's like, okay, let's do it again. So he books it for the following week. So it's just a one night event. And, uh, and then what happened is just, it sold out again. He's like, shit, okay, let's do it again. And then what happened is like there was kind of a mainstream radio station at the time, like they play rock, but kind of like the kind of rock that maybe your parents would also listen to in the car. And it's not <laughs> sure. You know, and it, the DJ loved the movie and started talking about it on like a mainstream radio show. And so um, even though it was super rough around the edges, it was filmed in Austin and it was about like being the and I'm like, hey, and so, uh, so he started promoting it and then it just started selling out. It sold out for three weeks in a row and they bumped Peter Bogdanovich's film. <laughs> <laughs> the highlight when I was like 23, uh, cause 
Yeah, Peter Bogdanovich's film, uh, The Cat's Meow, was playing. And I love Peter Bogdanovich, and I really admire all of his films. So, but our movie was making more money than his. And so Tim bumped us into the main slot, and it was like, holy moly. So I had the experience of watching people react to that movie over and over and over again. Because I went to each of the screens, I watched it, and I knew we were trying to do a Hollywood remake. So when I went to pitch in Hollywood, I was like, you fucking people are so out of it. Like you're not in touch with young people, but you're having that same experience now. Like whatever format you're communicating with people on, it's like, you're having that conversation. You know what I mean? That, that people that have the power to make decisions are not privy to. And so it should give you license to tell the story that you think is cool. Um, and then everyone will have to come along. It's not going to make you rich, yeah. <laughs> but it's going to, you know, it, that's like, there's, that's the, that's why you're here. That's why you're alive and you're telling stories for you now. Like, what, what's your, what's your story, you know? And <laughs> hundred years from now, people want to know what, it, what was going on at your age now. And, um, that, that's a yeah. really good point. You know, I, it was, I, a few months ago we were in the, we went to the Sioux City International Film Festival and. Um, oh, I can't remember her name. She teaches at Loyola Marymount, but she, she's done a lot of writing. She sells a lot of stuff and she was there and she was saying that so many people are so wanting to just be in the writer's room at all that they kind of lose their voice a little bit, that they're just so, I just want to be working. And then, you know, when you ask them about, okay, what are you creating? What are you writing? You know, it's a little bit easy to get lost in other people's work. At times. Yeah, yeah. No, definitely. And, and, and watching something else becomes an excuse. It's like, it, it's a way of procrastinating because I, I mean, I've watched you know, a, a billion things, but I also, I do also recognize that, that feeling like, uh, watching other things gives you confidence. It's like watching stand up comedy on an open mic night. You need to have that version where you're like, mm, that's how I would do it. You know, like that, that little voice that could be that little, mm, yeah, I, I think I would do it a little different. That thing is, is going to be you. And uh, yeah, in, in terms of the writing, yeah, that, that evolves in, in like where, where, where uh, In Search of Men I Kiss came out, like it was written very, very quickly. Um, I mean, in a matter of weeks, but it was from a document that had been, you know, called over several years of, Mm. shitty things that are happening and breakups and so on and then uh i, I read in the la times about it was called the la times article was called in search of midnight Kiss, and it was about the phenomenon that at that time dating uh online dating profiles increased right around new year's eve and i thought <laughs> oh man what a great idea to make a movie about and that became that just became it all fell into place and it's like oh Great, now everything makes sense. Because if you go, if you look at that movie, it's three act structure by the book. I mean, oh, yeah. They're, yeah. They're, they're at 24 minutes, they're, you know, at 30 minutes, there's a B story. It's, it's like by the book. That's not to say it was written like that because it was a really long script. It was like 135 pages. Um, now, like, it would never have been able to present that to a studio because they would say it would go into development, it would take forever to get it down to 100 pages. When you have your friends, you can be like, here's the script. You know, there's some scenes that are going to be too long, but it's better we shoot it out and then we can edit it down. Mm. So yeah, the first version was of course three hours and it got, gets whittled down and whittled down. And um, yeah, and then we've got really good producers and Ann Walker who made all of uh, Rick Linkletter's films. She was our executive producer and she just came in and was like, you know, giving great notes on things to cut and, and, you know, it just, of course, it's going to get down. It's going to get boiled down to have 24 minutes. They're having their moment where they're on the date. That's just how it's going to be. Yeah. Like as much as you don't think it's going to be that way, <laughs> you edit it, you're going to feel that, 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 that boredom. You're going to feel it and you're going to be like, and it just, it's going to boil it down. The pace of that so, film is so good because, you know, I, you know, before sunset, I watched it this afternoon, you know, during lunch, I watched it and I was thinking about, about In Search of a Midnight Kiss and 
in search of a midnight kiss moves so fast. Mm. I mean, it moves very quickly. And I know, I mean, if you're like me, when I go back and look at my stuff, I, I don't ever feel like it moves fast. But everybody else says, oh, it moves really fast. But that that film does move really fast. Hey, and I, a, I thought, for think sure. about the pace, you know, in it too. But I, I don't want to get too lost in that for a second. But I want to go back to the the character, the, the female character in the film, Sarah's character. Yeah, Vivian. And, yeah, Vivian, and how she's developed there. And that whole beginning where you don't see her eyes for the longest time and, and the, me the medication bottles and the slow reveal yeah. of that character. And actually Shelby and I got into a little bit of a debate about the character. And I said, well, you know, she's a little neurotic and a little, yeah, and Shelby's yeah. like, no, I love her. I love her. I love her. Love you know? her. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And, and be loved. Yeah. Well, okay. So two things. Um, uh, um, Oh God, Mia Farrow's character in uh, in the Woody Allen film, uh, where he's an agent. Um, oh, uh, um, black and white film. Uh, yeah. He's an agent, and one of his top clients is 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 dating Mia Farrow. No, it's not. Yeah. yeah. What's that? What's the name of that movie? Um, I, I, I it's not remember. Manhattan because that's not. No, 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 it's not Manhattan. It's, uh, <laughs> it's probably Danny Rose. Okay, Broadway Danny Rose. Oh, okay, yeah, there you that, go. Look, there, I'm really ripping off a lot of stuff there because Mia Farrow has the big glasses on when you first meet her. She's very, uh, uh, she's very difficult to read. I mean, it's a very different movie. You would never know, but like, mm -hmm. you're a super hardcore watcher of movies, and then you know, uh, yeah. I would never have made that connection. <laughs> Broadway Danny Rose. Yeah, it's a very very different movie, but the way that she is hard and difficult to understand, but you're intrigued by her and then you follow her along and then she slowly loosens up and the moment she reveals, takes her glasses, like for, for Midnight Kiss, it was all about like, you know, disarmoring this person. Yeah. And, and so there's all that physicality. So she's, she's in control, you know? And then slowly, the moment she takes her glasses off is the first time she likes him. And then, you know, by the end of it, she's naked emotionally, physically and everything. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, so that's just a very, practical way of understanding a character in terms of what's interesting for your actors to do I think what you should do also is just like for yourself you, I always do this for myself like would I want to play that part not that I would like do that but would I feel jealous if somebody else played that part would it be exciting for me to play that part and read it yourself as though I want to say these lines in front of a, <laughs> in front of a camera and if you feel that way then the actor is going to feel that way mm -hmm. which means being a, a, a leading man is oftentimes boring. Um, and so there's really great 180 degree turns in that movie, but that was really inspired by Christopher Durang, who is a playwright, a New York playwright. And his movies are, his plays are all wacky, just completely hilarious. But people make these incredible pivots. Mm -hmm. So they're saying like, how dare you? You know, I would never do such a thing. I love doing that. I love it, it's my favorite. Like they. And so I thought it was just so funny the way his characters would be so strongly opinionated and then change their opinions. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it was fun for the characters because then they can, or for the actors who, and he worked with uh, all of these great actors that went, mm -hmm. uh, that went through his, <laughs> it's funny side note. I was waiting tables um, and I, I really liked Christopher Durang and I had read all his plays and so on. And he used the same cast. So going back to you and your friends and using the same people over and over because you get to know them and think, oh, it'd be interesting with that person doing that. That's what you're going to do. Um, I mean, it happened with, you know, Bergman used the same people over and over because he can envision that, oh, Max von Sydow should do this. And, um, uh, so he was working with this guy, um, um, it's Paul Giamatti's brother. Um, his name is Marcus, Marcus Giamatti, who is a, also a really good actor. Um, mm -hmm. And I was waiting tables. And then this guy was, who came in all the time and I'm like, man, your voice, you sound just like that guy. What's his name? I don't know, the guy from Sideways. He's like, Paul Giamatti? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> my brother. I'm like, uh, and I was like, oh, Marcus Giamatti, he's in the, he's in the Christopher Durang books because it lists the casts on each of his plays. And um, 
So it was quite cool just to get to meet him and know that like, you know, in, in an alternate universe, it's very similar. Like he, you know, mm -hmm. you know working with his friends and the same group right. of people and you're thinking, you're thinking about things for them. All those characters, uh, I mean, Brian McGuire's character in, in Search of Men and a Kiss was in the other three films. I mean, that was, yeah. I mean, that was my room. That Wilson's room is my, my old room. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's where I lived. That was my car. That was all, all that, you know, crashed. All that stuff really happened to me. I mean, it really did go through this breakup and end up in LA in a way I'd never intended. And so, yeah, you use what you have. And, and the more personal it is and the more embarrassing it is, the more somebody else is gonna be like, that's me. And so there's really, once you're embarrassed, that's when you know you're probably onto something. Yeah, and you know, I, I think one of the things in that, that film especially is everyone in that film, I kept looking at those people thinking, these could be my friends. I mean, these seem like people that would be my friends. Yeah. And I'm constantly telling students, every Friday I have breakfast with my students that are writing. And I go through their stuff and we have breakfast and we talk and it's very difficult to get students to write honestly, like really honestly, like kind of look inside themselves and say, okay, I'm at, here's something that's uncomfortable in my life, right? but I'm afraid to write about it and to get them to be brave enough to write as honestly, because that's the thing I think that caught me in that film is it's written so honestly yeah, I, I had no idea until you and I just had this conversation about how much of you is in that film. Oh, yeah. And, and it was it was I mean, I, I mean, all of that stuff that the little kid who's like when my laptop, my laptop really did get stolen. That film that I came out to L.A. to remake, I had me and Sam had rewritten it. But back then there wasn't the Internet to keep saving stuff. I had it on a jump drive in a laptop and someone biked by from the stroller and took it like just like in the movie exactly like there's no difference <laughs> it just happened and then i filmed it later um and so but that little kid is like is my uh nephew uh and so you, you, every little piece of it you use you use every you know you use what you have and um yes and the, and the more terrifying and embarrassing it is then other people feel that way too you're not alone um and however depressed and frustrated you are with your parents or your lack of opportunity somebody else feels that way like find a way of saying it uh, yeah. so that brings me to another place too after after winning the casavetes and then i mean it's cool because i watch that and here you guys are all at independent spirit and and there's there's you know big names all around and you know i'm sure you're getting meetings and stuff mm -hmm. so after that there had to be some big changes, but you know, when I see Meet Me in Montenegro, there's a part where the character says, I haven't made a film in several years. So I yeah. mean, I'm interested in that. Yeah, I mean, this is the, yeah, I, um, I had another movie that I was gonna make that I had been working on. And, and, and so it was really, that's really what I was intending to make. It's called 500 Reasons to Kill Yourself. And it's comedy and it's, uh, um, it's a straight up insane comedy uh, that I love. I still love it. Um, the reality is when you make a movie like Insurgent Men I Kiss, it breaks you financially um, because it, I just, I, uh, that movie we made for $25,000 and it, mm -hmm. I mean, it ended up becoming a hit in Europe. It like it played at the box office and it became a hit in Greece and then in Spain and made over a million in box office, just theatrically. I never made anything. I just <laughs> had my credit card still. Everybody was, in Europe made plenty of money. <laughs> I was just, you know, and in America it was the worst. I, I never got anything and they didn't, and they didn't, uh, I mean, it, it, at least they would start to pay us back in Europe and in here, nothing. Like they, they bought the movie for 25 years and they, that's why there's a screwed up released black uh, color version. They had a problem, like it was released in the theaters in black and white. We worked so hard to make it in black and white. They would only release it if they, we delivered them. We went back to the original tapes, which we always intended for this movie to be black and white, but we, we shoot in color at the time because it's supposed to have a better grayscale and then blah, blah, blah. Once they discovered, oh, there's actually real tapes that have color, oh, well then deliver us a color version for TV possibly, and then we'll, we'll, 
we'll print a film and go to black and white for you on. on the, I had no idea. I had no I idea it was intended it. to be black and white. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, I mean, it is what it is, but yeah, even the one that's in color, that's on, I mean, it's, it's widely available in Europe. It's not at all available here. Um, it just makes no sense. I've asked them a billion times to like, at least put it on Netflix or put it on Amazon or something, but they just don't care. Like, honestly. So, um, <laughs> that's a, that's a shame. But people I, have to I, get it illegally and I'm okay with that. Like get it illegally. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and I just, I don't, I think Ben and Shelby watched it on YouTube. So, I mean, I yeah. think, yeah, but it's such a shame. I have one copy of it on DVD and, and my students, I was like, don't you touch that. It's hard to get. <laughs> it's my that's only one. Impossible to get now. Yeah. It's get impossible to get now. So that's. We have a 35 millimeter print. So someday we'll go back. So what happened after that is um, I wanted to make a, a really, a really eclectic film. Uh, I mean, it, it was fucking, it's a funny laugh out loud movie. Um, but uh, I was broke as a joke. So I just was taking meetings to do rewrite stuff just to, you know, and it's like you make no money. Like you, you pitch and pitch and pitch ideas to rewrite something for some Hollywood studio, which for $50,000, it sounds like it's a lot. You get about $12,000 out of that because when you don't know what you're doing, you're like, okay, finally, I got a job to write something for some studio. Okay, $50,000. Your agent takes 10%, your manager takes 10%, your lawyer takes 5%. You get taxed. When you don't know what you're doing, you get taxed on the W-2 at the full amount off $50,000. So after all this pitching and going, now here's $12,000. That's for you to go and do. So I'm just like financially just so painfully uh, trying to just get out of the hole. So that's like the, the downside. But I wrote another film and then Fox Searchlight bought it. Um, and the, that's what I was working on. That was like the big secret project, Five Reasons to Kill Yourself. I had sent it to a really, really famous actress and I was just waiting on her. I loved it for this role. And, uh, and so she finally read it and said, yeah, I'm in. And so I went to meet with her we really got along. And then Fox Searchlight, I had been, I did something, I was trying to get money. And so I was, I, I signed up to direct something for Fox Searchlight. And then they, they discovered that I had this other film. And I never even, I don't even know how they got it. I think an assistant slipped it to them. And they just sent over an offer to just straight up buy the film. So that was great because for the first time in my life I had some money, but now you're totally at the mercy of whether or not they're going to make the movie, you know? And so it was, uh, I mean, they're really, really smart and thoughtful. And they're also, you know, watching the, the market really carefully as to like, is this going to be, because it's a surreal film. It takes place in, in life and the afterlife, but it's a straight up comedy. Um, and and so, yeah, we, we did casting. We had like table reads with like <laughs> the most famous people you could imagine. This is what I was doing and no one knows about um, at the studios. And then at the end of the day, they decided to not make the film, which happens, you know? And so, but you've just sold this thing that you've been like, it's your baby. And now you can't get it made, you know? And so I was so devastated um, at that moment. Yeah, I ended up going to Europe and then just making a, a movie which we just kind of, we didn't even finish writing. We just started shooting it. So that movie has a really, really kind of like a, like a knitted quilt type quality. It's imperfect, yeah. <laughs> but it's beloved. Um, and, and you're talking about Meet, Meet Me in Montenegro, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like, it's one of those movies where you're like, so you've been, trying to make a big movie forever. And then you're like, well, fuck it, let's just make a, a, a tiny movie. Like we're gonna use the good cameras that you know we have access to that are gonna look great. I know these can shoot 4K or 2K. And then instead of like trying to raise the money, we're just gonna do it on a tiny budget because I had right. to have some money. And then I could just call up some friends and see if we can, you know, but it just, it, it's, it's a, you're biting off a lot. If you say, oh, let's shoot in five countries and let's do this and so. Yeah, because yeah. it's, Berlin, LA, London, Montenegro, and Macedonia, right? 
Montenegro, but yes. So we shot Mount, we did shoot in Macedonia as well, yes. A little bit. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's right, Lake Or. It's crazy. Uh, I mean the, yeah. the, the number of the number of locations is is crazy there. Now you didn't you wrote that with with your, your then girlfriend. Yeah, my wife now. Yeah. Your wife now, yeah. yeah. And um, I went through and watched uh, uh, pretty much every interview I could find mm -hmm. uh, with the two of you. And that's a really charming, really charming movie. You know, I mean, I, I went through it. I have to admit, I didn't watch it as deep, deep. I kind of watched it on an entertainment level a little bit. Yeah. Which is, yeah. Well, which I mean, is a little more than my, you know, professor level taking notes thing. But, you know, again, you know, it comes back to that writing what you know. I mean, mm -hmm. and that's, I mean, that's pretty autobiographical, isn't it? I mean, between the two of you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is and it is. It was kind of like, well, let's let's do something. Well, what do we have access to? Okay. It started off as us making a little bit of a short film and then saying, okay, let's make, let's build on that. And then it kind of spiraled out from there. And then you have to start figuring it out. And so it went through major changes in the editing room, which is a, it's a terrifying experience to have to deal with. But um, it ended up, it has so many voices that it's, I still love it, although it has its own, we didn't write it as traditionally, where it's you, okay, let's write it, let's really beat it out and get it as perfect as we can. So it has a, a little bit of a, I don't know, I, I, I do love it, but I, I do, I, I wring my hands of everything. When you talk about pacing of, uh, of movies, like I'm a warrior, and like, if you talk about in, uh, Before Sunset, Rick is like the smartest, coolest, like, you know, Rick Linkletter, cool as a cucumber person. He, so he's very secure as a person. And I think it yeah. maybe reflect that because he can talk with you like you're going to, we're going to have an interesting conversation and this is how it's going to go and you're on the ride. And I'm like, always like, you know, nervously wringing my hands. <laughs> um, so yeah I mean he's he's literally the person I called up last week when we had I can't because I have a new movie we have a new movie there's a script oh it's been I'm really excited about the script but we finally got our lead actor and it's a really really good actor and we're <laughs> pairing them up so we're right in the middle of that and so yeah I called Rick Linkletter to be like okay you've handled this so well like you know sure. it's so stressful how do you you know, you're trying to decide between these people and get your movie made, and it's very precarious. And how do you do that? And um, yeah, and so you uh, it's just like friends, you the, the great filmmakers are open and accessible and down to earth, and they're kind of like, well, what's your situation? That was that's an interesting. I mean, conceptually, one of the things I really caught in that film is you know you've got the you know kind of the relationship that's the solid relationship that's really forming, while the other relationship is disintegrating and you can feel it disintegrating from the word go. I mean, the yeah. minute you see those characters, you think, okay, they're headed for disaster. Yeah. Know? Yeah. 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 And it it's so interesting because you have this, this rising and falling that yeah. comes in there where you feel like you're rooting for the couple, whereas yeah. you're, you're kind of letting yourself down with another. And it's, it's that rare cinema experience. I think that you have in the duality of it. Yeah. And that's what really kind of, caught me in that that film and i don't know if was i don't know was that an intention yeah was that that's, a, that's exactly right that was the whole that's the big idea it was just like okay let's watch one couple fall apart while one grows together and, and starts to trust each other and the other one loses trust and how, how how does that happen for me on a on a personal note i was never intending to move back to los angeles and so uh, i mean that kiss was my arrival to los angeles and maybe a lot was supposed to be my exit <laughs> <laughs> They keep pulling you back in. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> you know, the um, I was especially when we take a look at it at, at where you are now and in, in what you're working on. I'm just kind of curious where you are going forward now after those two great films. Yeah, and um, there's another. I, I, I co wrote a film called Frank and Cindy that's on Netflix. That uh, oh yeah. Uh, that's really just, it's an adaptation of a movie, of a documentary that my friend G.J. made, but yeah. uh, I, you know, I have Russo, feelings about right? that movie too, but G.J. is just a great guy and a great filmmaker. And, you know, 
probably get a kick out of that if you're into rock music and kind of dysfunctional family situations. Yeah, it's it's based on the like a a band that had a one hit song, right? Yeah, that's his that's his stepfather. All that's yeah, right. and it's it's Rene Russo and Oliver Platt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so so what, what we're doing now, well, um, yeah, we're like we've been working on this script for a long time, and so this guy named J uh, James. Uh, Yee, it's James J. Yee. There's two James Yee's. That's why I'm saying his middle name. Um, he produced a film called Gook. Uh, it won Sundance like um, I, don't know, two years I ago. know that film. Yeah, it's a very cool black and white movie about very family cool life from the Asian perspective. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, he read the script that we wrote uh, and he's like, I really like it, but I don't think it should be a male lead. It was a male lead. And we were like, oh, like, He's right. Like it should be a female lead. The, 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 the movie makes more sense. Yeah. And so, well, of course, that's a page one rewrite. And so we spent sure. about a year and a half rewriting the film with him, giving us notes, and we finally had it. And then we just took it out. And I obviously, I you know, the agents liked it. So you just you, you normally don't get any help mm -hmm. when you have a script. No one wants to read your script unless there's money involved because why would I send your script to that actor that you like who then says oh I like this movie and then you can't make that that's basically why the agents are such gatekeepers and it's so difficult the reality is just to why you shouldn't play that game um, is that the number of people who quote unquote are meaningful financially are like about this it's it's like five people there's 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 literally no one you think Oh, so and so has got to be famous, and they're great. They will not get your movie made, and so it's just a very, very difficult uh, game. Like it's ne it absolutely don't worry about. Oh, we can bring it to so and so. They're a they're a sporting actor on whatever show you're thinking yeah. about. It doesn't matter. It does not matter. Just get people you think are good for the role. They could be your local theater. That's what I did on uh, and Sexless, my second film. Yeah, I went to the local theater and saw people. Uh, yeah, and I just thought, wow, this. And I wrote parts for them because they, they're, yeah. they're great actors. Like if you take an acting class, which I recommend everybody doing, because uh, you're going to see other actors. Especially take an acting class where actors have to perform scenes. It seems like that would be an obvious thing. That's not the case. <laughs> There's a lot of like technique actor uh, acting classes which. You know, you can do what you want, but I think that it's, as a filmmaker, it's not as interesting. Watching scene, watching actors have to put up scenes and then be critiqued is really effective because uh, mm -hmm. you get to watch what they pick. You get to see how they act. They fucking can knock your socks off. You could literally be crying in a room in some shitty place in Los Angeles and be like, no one will ever see this and this person will never be a star and it was just a phenomenal performance. Yeah. So like, and I've seen that over and over and over again. Um, and that was, and that was important to experience that. When I was thinking about Vivian from In I Kiss, that I had that experience. Yeah. yeah. Um, I would just, I'd love to cast her in anything. I uh, mean, yeah. I, I mean, the minute I saw her, I was like, I would love to cast her in something. <laughs> she was, she's a theater person. That she was like this, you know, doing all of these plays in Houston and. Yeah. And it was like fantastic. And so you knew she had chops. And like when you get an actor like that, you can oh. do take after take and they'll cry. Oh, yeah. and they'll do it again and they'll cry again. And you're like, it, it makes you look so good. <laughs> it really is there. They have range and they can tap into those emotions over and over. And yeah. everything about filmmaking is so artificial. You know, it's hard to access those emotions. But if you take an acting class, It'll make you harder. It'll make you think about your dialogue and your scenes. Mm -hmm. It'll make you think about your scenes because you'll think, "What is interesting? What would I want to put up in that class?" That makes that's fun. Mm -hmm. And fun can mean sad. Fun can mean you know, mm -hmm. comedy is just a another form of thing. But what what grabs you? Um, and so, yeah, it, and it makes you harder. You don't hand over a script to somebody to read or perform. That would be embarrassing. That's interesting. If you make yourself do it. Interesting. Wow. 
Well, yeah. hey guys, you know, I've been dominating this conversation a little bit. So if anybody's got some other questions. Uh, yeah, I wanted to talk about uh, sort of your process a little bit, specifically because the actors in uh, Search for Midnight Kiss are so wonderful. And you said you'd worked with Scoot and Sarah quite a bit. I assume you wrote the roles for them then? Yeah, everybody. Everybody's roles. Everybody, yeah. So did you, did they have a whole lot of input in those characters or was it very, very close to the script? All written. So uh, like with Brian McGuire, I sat down with him and we just listened to the script on the final draft, you know, in here, here, ex here. That we listened to the whole script and it was like, all right, I got it. <laughs> and then, and then, um, and then what we would do is we would only, we would rehearse each night. So we would shoot during the day, then we would go home. Home was, my home which was wilson's house brian mcguire lived in the other room so that was just where where we shot the kitchen what's the, the kitchen where they are and then I, that's where we go and rehearse which is okay you're exhausted all right what scenes are we doing tomorrow okay this one is, all right all right let's do it and then okay screw sarah go read you know and then they just start reading their lines and if it's uh so sometimes you then uh, after they're done i would rewrite it Sometimes it would be like, they start to say something and you're long-winded when you're a writer, you're gonna say shit that just like, once people say it out loud, you're gonna be like, oh my God. Like we, we know it, we're so much faster than you think we are. And so when you hear it, you go, okay, okay, good, 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 stop. And then you can make a note, like cut these lines, these are really cheesy mm. or whatever. Um, and so, yeah, just hearing it out loud. And sometimes this is what would happen with them because they had such amazing chemistry. It went like this, like, okay, go ahead and read. And they start going through the lines. I'd be like, stop, 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 stop. Good, next scene. It's gonna work. I know it's gonna work. Yeah. Next scene, next scene. Because they, you could just see, like, it was interesting the way that they were connecting and you could feel like there was some emotion between them and I didn't want to over-rehearse them and it was gonna work. And so long as they, so the, the direction was, you know, just you can say it whatever you want. Just don't change the beats. Mm -hmm. So because you kind of know as a writer, normally when you're writing, you're going to beat sheet out a scene. And this happens yeah. and this happens and this happens. So you need, to, you need to make sure those events occur so that your story has forward momentum into the next scene. Mm -hmm. So they can, you know, making it more natural for them. Um, yeah. And, and so that was the process. So yeah, so they would do it. Then I would rewrite it at night. And then in the morning I would give them new sides. Um, and if they were like just really clicking, I didn't, I just cut them off so that they didn't have to, I knew tomorrow we would have to do it a hundred times and it's mm -hmm. hard to hold that level of emotion. Um, and so, yeah, so that would be, that would be the process. And again, if it's your friends, they're gonna, you're going to have a lot longer leash to have that scene that's five pages that you know is going to end up being three minutes. Mm -hmm. It's a page a minute. You, you, you watch any movie, it's like pretty much two and a half minutes is a, is a scene. If it's longer, it's like they're doing something stylistic. They're, okay, five minute scene is a big scene. Oh, it's like a seven minute scene or in Rick Linkletter, like a 10 minute scene. Oh, it's interesting. They're breaking the rules. They're doing, but like 99% mm -hmm. of times, I know I'm going to get bored after two and a half minutes. So, so it's, you're, you're, you're clicking in your head, three pages. Okay, is that five page scene? Can I cut it down to, cause like the, the scene with Vivian, when they meet at the cafe, that was a long ass scene. Oh my God. And we had so much coverage. It, it's like, and so that was just like, like she was shaking by the end of it. Cause she's having to do so many espressos and smoke so much. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny though. The, the like, lines are so quippy back and forth, you know. Are you religious? You know, just back and like back and forth. Those yeah, one liners are the, the one line responses just crack me up. He's just yeah, so yeah. baffled. He's the look at his face, he's so baffled by this moment. It's just yes, so yes, funny. Yes. yes, he's great. But Christopher Durang, the playwright, you should uh, read his stuff and you'll see, oh wow, Alex is really taking a lot of stuff from this. Uh Broadway Danny Rose, you know, everybody's you know, your influence and use it and reinvent it for yourself. And, um, but you know, those are, especially like people don't watch Bergman films, so they don't know. It's a great influence. No one will I watch Bergman films. 
<laughs> I've seen I've seen a Bergman film. <laughs> yeah. Thing they have like amazing repertoire, but also well, I mean, there's these incredible camera movements that are just like, yeah. still. Yeah. That's a that's an interesting thing, you know. Like I'll have that. I'll notice that with students, you know. It's like you know, I'll watch them have. A Truffaut film, or I know Shelby likes Agnes Varda. You know what I mean? We want, you know, we'll show them films, and then it's really interesting. They get on set and they say, "Okay, I want this to look just like this, this from this Bergman film." I think having that reference, that classical reference thing, you know, I mean, you know, it's, I, I mean, it's so funny. I have students come and say, "I just want to be Wes Anderson," and it's so funny because they'll say, "Well, that scene on the beach in Moon- Moonrise Kingdom is is from is." From a Bergman, or you'll say this yeah. is very like a Truffaut, or I love Noah Bumbach and Francis Haas, my favorite film. Well, that's a <laughs> Truffaut. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so, it's, it's... Hang on, I'm gonna. I need to plug in my other um, power cable. This is no, no, no. It's it's okay. You're good. That's okay. So this is really fun. This is I've wanted then... to do this for the longest time, so I'm really glad I found this email address. This has been like a really fun hour thus far. Oh, it's not so good. Hi, Rob, by the way. Yeah. Um, you're so right, though. Like, it, but it's it's an ongoing process. Like, because those filmmakers, like Wes Anderson, there was this, uh, like, I didn't even know about this other filmmaker. It's like some Czech filmmaker. But I lived in Berlin a long time, and there's this really great video store there. And, he, and it's like on the box. Like, I used to work at a video store. And someone wrote, this is where Wes Anderson got all of his ideas. <laughs> I'm like, oh, fuck, I got to see this one. Last night, we watched um, a, tar- uh, a Tarkovsky film, sure. which makes it sound super intellectual, right? Tarkovsky, but we really did. Uh, <laughs> I just had another professor suggest one to me like two weeks ago. Yeah. Okay. He sent me an email suggesting one to me. He goes, oh, it's in the library. Go get it. Well, yeah. Now, this one's on Amazon. Um, mm-hmm. It's called Stalker. But Lost totally ripped this movie off. Like, <laughs> I mean, the whole concept is, is similar. Like, I don't want to say say what, but you know, it's that's just to say, good filmmakers watch cool stuff and go, oh, that's an interesting idea. And so, um, you know, of course you can have your your idols. It's better to have um, idols one layer back so you can kind of you know disguise it. That's like a you know, Woody Allen's first, uh, in his first movies, he was saying, I was just doing straight up Charlie Chaplin impersonation. That's mm-hmm. it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's really true. So I, think, I think that's really interesting. Yeah. Hey, Fassbender's yeah. a good one for young people that don't I love Fassbender. Yeah. Fucking awesome. And like, mm-hmm. I don't know why he's not, uh, I don't know, I don't see enough about him. Dude made 40 movies in 15 years. Exactly. And then exactly. some. And he's working with the same filmmakers over yeah. and over. And he's yeah, got exactly. low budgets and really edgy material. His life is really crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, just very cool movies. And mm-hmm. very complicated camera movements. Things that like... Oh, yeah. yeah. Very so, complex characters. Oh, yeah. God. Movies. Yeah. And, and I think one of the things that's really interesting resource wise, and Ben and I had had this conversation about, about Midnight Kiss. It was that, you know, at first he goes, well, I wasn't quite sure it was black and white and it, and I, I wasn't quite sure what it was shot on. And it was shot on some kind of small body camera, right? Something that was inexpensive. Yeah. That was. Yeah. It was a Sony VX7, which was a 2997 uh, HDV camera. So it was like the intermediary between DV and uh, HD. It was just before they had, you know, like we were all about DV. It was like such a breakthrough for us. Like mm-hmm. we could, you know, instead of shooting NTSC VHS, like uh, suddenly we could shoot, oh, wow, we could edit it. Digital. It in, no loss. This is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's because we had, um, from the generation that you are mike we're like yeah okay i shot on 16 and yeah fascinating and but you could do a whole this is this is our first our first trailer because we're trying to raise money to make our first movie mm-hmm. 16 millimeter i get scoot mcnary and uh matt bearden uh, he's a, a comedian uh in the car we're shooting a two shot it's all just a single two shot through the window um it, it was like a pain in the ass to figure out how to expose inside the car through a window right. back then because you had to go back 
there's so many things you had to think about back then. Like it was hard to like, how much light can you get? Is the light going to burn the person in the? <laughs> and, yeah. and so we do all this stuff. Like LEDs. Yeah, <laughs> to, so have, to, have... up to the front of the car. Yeah, now you've got LEDs and you can see right and see exactly what, what you couldn't do that before. And, <laughs> and so you set all this stuff up. And you, it's like you have it all, all contraptions, things from like Home Depot cranking down to like hold on the camera to the front of the car. And it's really okay, 16 millimeters. So you're blowing through money here. You got your actors in there ready. Okay, you guys ready? Okay, all right, good. Okay, rolling. Okay, go. And then they drive off and they do the scene. That's a hundred bucks a reel. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. So they go and they roll it out and they come back and you send it off at, uh, to the lab. And several days later, you get it. You see it. You don't know what, like, I did get exposure. Yeah. So the first image, it comes up. Boom. Perfect. And they're in there. It's like perfectly exposed inside the car. They look great. Like, everything's crystal clear. You're like, Dude, yes, we did yeah. it. And so I like, can't wait to see this first take. They drive off and suddenly a sock that had been placed on the eye hole because right before we drove off, it was like, <laughs> hey, I heard that can like that can affect the exposure, the sunlight shooting in through the eye hole. The sock flips over, boom, and covers up the whole camera. So it's just <laughs> a whole reel is just a sock. And so you just blew all that money, and you're, you know, all the actors and people you got there, you're like, oh. Well, yeah, you know, if you got to set up your lab, dailies is not really a, a term that works. You know, it's weeklies or you know. Yeah. <laughs> but we would, at I midnight mean, kiss, we would watch the daily oh, gosh. night. We we would go back and watch what we shot that day, and then we would rehearse the next scene. People felt yeah. motivated and excited because they would see, oh, this is gonna work. Yeah, that's a- because they're not making money, and you're asking them to, you know, do things over and over and over and over. And especially when you're shooting like that on the streets, which I recommend because Hollywood film, when you have a budget, you have to pay for everything. You have to close things down, you have to pay for extras. When you have no money, you can get away with crazy ass great stuff. Mm-hmm. Use your the architecture of your city, your place, the extras. You can wireless mic up people. This is all we were doing. And they would shoot across the street and then we would just film it. But that means that like a bus pulls up to take its load. Actors are on, on go. So they don't know. So they're having to yeah. go through it. So, you're across the street going, you know, like stop, do it again. And then they have to go back and they have to have the energy to be like, and they're always pissed at you because you're making it do it over and over and over. And they don't know <laughs> if it's working and they're pissed and hungry and there's no catering because it's, you know. You know, both of, both of those films, both, you know, Meet Me at Montenegro and In Search of a Midnight Kiss, there's a lot of like romancing the locations, which I like a lot. Especially, I think, in, in Search for a Midnight Kiss, because you don't see L.A. looking like that. You usually see sparkly, shiny L.A. Yeah. You don't see, you know, like, you know, the, you know, boarded up buildings. You know, some of the things that you see yeah. there, the gritty are part of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I, I like that. It just feels so much more honest. Yeah, yeah, no, that was what we experienced. I mean, I was, loved downtown. I was just roaming around downtown. I mean, I loved it and hated it because it's like, it, it's it's a sad state where it was what could have been. You know, there was a trolley downtown. Yeah. There were 1,200 theaters, 1,200 theaters in the heyday downtown. Um, it must have been a dreamland. And to think what it had become, it's just, and so you see this relic of what could have been. And it's, uh, yeah, and, and yet there's, even though when I went in, I thought this is going to be my burn LA to the ground movie. And then in the end, everyone's like, it's a love letter to LA. I'm like, it really is. Maybe it is, but uh, I didn't know that. The thing is, you don't know what you're making. And then when you I watched that, the, when I was in the editing room of my second film, it wasn't until I watched the whole thing and I go, oh my God, like it hit me. I'm like, this, is, this movie is about a couple breaking up. And I then went, on, went through a breakup. But I didn't realize that that's what you're making. And, you know, mm-hmm. and so your movie takes on a force of itself, but you can't control that. You, you have to go with what you think it's about, and then later on you concede to what it actually is about. That's a that's a funny thing, and you know, I I screened one of my films this past year, and I think when you when you screen, and I'm interested in your thoughts on this. When you when you screen to an audience, and I don't care how many things you screen, you always get that feeling of they tend to like things that you'll never think that they'll like. And some of the things that you think will be the biggest things they kind of like maybe don't grab onto. And that scene where they walk into 
the abandoned theater. Actually, I think one of the most romantic endearing scenes is the scene where she wants to see the theater and he goes and asks permission for her to see the theater, that, yeah. that gesture. Yeah. And then when she walks in and she's just so overwhelmed by it, yeah. that was really touching. I mean, I thought that one scene, I thought, okay, this is a guy, this is a good guy. This is a yeah. good, good guy. Yeah. And let me tell you how that, sorry, go on. No, please, please go ahead. Okay. I'm interested in your thoughts. Okay, so what you're saying is exactly right. From the writing perspective, you know, he has to go and get her into this place. It's a show of good faith and he has positive energy and he goes in there and then you see this beautiful thing. And it's like your moment of, can he be optimistic? No, he shits on it. He still, he still can't get there. They have to have each other to like, to get back to that place where everything's not shit again. And so, but we know we had to do that. We had no permission to go into a theater at that point. We were uh, shooting another scene and then we saw that they were doing auditions for So You Think You Can Dance at the Paramount Theater. And so I'm like, Scoot, take her in, like we're gonna stand across the street and like talk to the security guard and see if you can like get her in. And that's what he did. So he's like, like that's, that's what Scoot is so great though, because he's like, he'll do is like, all right, fuck it, let's do it. You know, like you want your friend who's not embarrassed to do that, you know? Um, Cause sometimes like, I like, it would be so nice to give Scoot lines cause he'll read stuff without being critical. When I read it, sometimes I feel ashamed um, and then he'll read it just like, and I'm like, oh, that sounds good. It sounds good when you say it. Yeah. Um, so, so you knew you had to get a shot of them going into a theater. So I'm like, Scoot, go do it. So that's literally what he did. And it took me goddamn forever to get, to figure out how to do After Effects to make the sign not say, so you think you can dance. Um, but he really <laughs> talked to a security guard and is like, and gets her to come in. And she's all acting coy because He's literally telling the security guard, hey man, my girlfriend here, she's a great dancer. She wants, can you, can you just give us a shot? And so he talks her in and we were able to use that particular shot as, you know, because it had all the spirit. And then, so now practically, you know, from a writing perspective, boom, the next shot has to be amazing. It took forever and a day, but finally our producer found um, the Million Dollar Theater, a totally different theater that has a beautiful um, uh, roof and stuff. Uh, to allow it 45 minutes to shoot uh and so you, you we don't we have no lights we just you can just take their can lights and point them at the ceiling and get you know get the exterior get all the point of view shots then run down to the stage and get the silhouette shot of them acting on the balcony that's all you could do in 45 minutes so it's like hustle hustle hustle, hustle and then you're out and it's like here's 150 bucks to some you know manager of that theater okay so now you got part two part three now you're actually supposed to be on the stage of that place now you have to go get a real stage so now you have a friend in our case we had a friend who ran a, a, a like a really small theater so it's all black um and then we filmed all the acting on on so it's actually like three completely different theaters just to create that one moment but you know as a filmmaker you know what, what's written down and the beats that have to happen they guy has to convince this security guard to get them in then she, they have to go in and have a moment. It has to be beautiful. You have to pick a great theater and then worry about a place where you can lock down for a couple hours or a night to shoot all the acting scenes. Mm -hmm. And then, you, then you've got your, that's, that's how you do it with no money. Yeah. The spontaneity, you can, the spontaneity of that really feels good in that, that one mm -hmm. section. So, so, and I don't want to dominate all this, I suppose, you know, Ben and Shelby probably have a couple of questions, but I mean, I just, you know, that was something that was really interesting. What kind of stuff are you guys going to make? I actually have, um, I have a feature script that I'm think I'm going to finally dive into and, and try to get made. Um, and funny enough, because Mike, uh, Mike sat in on a read through for it that I did last week, oh. a couple of weeks ago and recommended you recommended in search for midnight kiss. And I watched and I was like, Oh crap, this is so <laughs> thematically and tonally similar because it's about uh two college kids who meet at a party and uh end up spending a lot of the night together and kind of grow closer but it has a very sort of bittersweet ending yeah so yeah i i would that's great that's a great story to to film because you you'll mm -hmm. have access to everything you need now mm -hmm. yeah. how are you going to cast it that's actually kind of the, the thing is i i probably am going to do an open casting call yeah 
um, which is a little nerve wracking because it since so much of the movie is these two characters, I'd say probably over 50% of the film is just two actors. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Finding that, that chemistry and like, I need a great Ellie and I need a great Xavier and they need to be great together. Yeah. Um, and I guess, I kind of wanted to ask you initially, like how did you achieve that, but you achieved it well, because you worked with, you worked with them and you knew them really well and you wrote the characters for them. Yeah, but I met the scoop through open casting. It was, uh, you know, and, and same thing with the other guy, Brian. I saw, I saw him in a short film that I loved and then I went up to the filmmakers and met him there and then we became friends and then he played parts in all the films. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sarah, I saw in a friend's film and then in a play and, uh, but the, the open casting, I would have never met Scoot had we not done that. And so, um, it, and nowadays it's even better because some of my friends who do the open casting, like maybe it's Backstage West, I don't know, Backstage West, one of those magazines does online stuff now. And, mm-hmm. and so people, and they're great actors, so they'll read your scenes and send them to you. Uh, yeah. a video, it's mm-hmm. like it's phenomenal. I mean, you yeah. should absolutely do that and don't be shy about it. Like you've got a feature People want to act. They want to be. You get, you've got two great roles, I'm sure. And now, it's like it'll be fun for you to see people. Uh, you know, it's so weird. It's so weird. I just cast. I, I'm working on a film right now, and I, I just cast three people, none of which were in the same room. They were yep. from. All, I mean, from four or five hours away, and they're making the drive. But I mean, it's that whole, that whole thing. You know, yeah. uh, doing that. So it is. It's it's being able to do it and. And I don't know if you ever, you know, I'll, if I go to a festival too, gosh, if I see somebody and I think they're fantastic, I rush right up to them and say, I, I'm dying to work with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. Oh yeah, I'm not shy about that. And I, I wish I were actually less shy. I've seen some other filmmakers are even more, like Joe Swanberg is like, walks right up and says, hey, I really love your performance. Can I get your email? Like, you know, and he's, so he's, he's very practical. And that's, you know, something to learn there. Absolutely. And Shelby's working on a thesis film. Yes. Uh, I um, I have a couple of different projects open right now. Um, I'm working on a feature script currently for graduate school. And then um, I have my thesis film that I'm working on, which I'm rebuilding um, Sigmund Freud's office in Vienna. So I'm working with the, um, the case of Dora and looking at hysteria. So I'm working with all period pieces and um, and then I'm working on another short film as well that I'm hoping, fingers crossed, I can shoot this summer as long as everything permits. But um, I also uh, like to write for my actors. Um, I just finished a short that's touring right now, but I wrote it with myself in mind because I, I knew I could play the role. So I knew how I spoke and it was easy that way. And so right now I, I have two younger actresses that I knew Shelby's, from. Shelby's modest. Her film was just a finalist at Bison and it's also yeah. <laughs> it's also a contention for best student film at IMPA. So, I mean, she's, she's, yeah. she's being modest, but she's got some stuff going. Yeah, so I am. I enjoy writing for people that I know. So I'm working with um, two actresses that I've previously like. I, I trained them actually, so um, I know how they speak and how they act and how they work. So it's really helpful to yeah. kind of just already have them in mind as I'm writing the scripts. Are you so you taking Dora and are you gonna are you going to make that as a film? Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, it hasn't yeah. been made before, and I'm, I think oh, that's, that's unfortunate. So. Yeah. I'm gonna make it probably into a 15, 20 minute film. Okay, so I, I read that book years ago, but it's like, yeah. Floyd, like what, we projected that she had multiple personalities? What was, what was? What um, no, thought? so he, he decided that she was hysterical, that she did have hysteria and she needed psychological treatment. So she was there for eight weeks and um, she left on her own accord after he started insinuating that she started having feelings for him instead of her father, which was weird. But so left and later committed suicide after going back and telling him that she was, that he was wrong. And she had a really unfortunate life and uh, there was a lot of sexual abuse in her past. And I I just, I really want to be able to tell her story because it's something that hasn't really been touched on in the past. And it's a case I think that goes kind of largely ignored. Yeah. But yeah, so. That sounds cool. No, I, that's very cool. That's a good idea. And I think people are aware of that story. Yeah. I wasn't really until you'd mentioned 
talking about it. It's, it's a rough one. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but it's well, also I'm, a smart movie just on the practical sense because you can you can handle all the motions. You could do a lot with two actors, uh, maybe two, three, four actors. The my my setup is because I'm taking everything exactly from the book, so it's all of his own case, like his own writings. So it's all going to take place like in the setting, like in the in three different um, scenes, basically. So like three different sessions. So I have um, pieces being made right now. Um, one of the other professors, she's a costumer. So she's designing all of the pieces for me and helping me out because I'm not a seamstress. So that's been really helpful. But so I'm setting up just so it's the office visits. And when we get into the dreams, I'm gonna actually shoot those on film and have those playing as she's explaining, you know, what she saw, how she's thinking, and then him trying to figure out what all, that all means. Now, what she means when she says on film is we actually got a 1966 Bolex mm -hmm. camera. That oh, we're really? actually, <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> yeah, Paul Hinneman, who's from Iowa, just this fantastic guy, sent us a full 16 millimeter film. I mean, the editing stuff, boxes of, boxes of, uh, I mean, just, just everything, everything. Yeah. It's got the top loader and it's, it's mm. crazy. So we're going to actually shoot those sequences on tr actual film and probably razor blade them and convert them to digital. So that'll be how it's done. Um, cool. And I won't get into too much here, but we produce between two and four short films a year in our program. It's an undergraduate awesome. program. Yeah. And then uh, we've had some students go out of here to do some good things. We've got a couple in LA and we've got, We've got one that just went to just finished Columbia. And I mean, we, we're, we're sending them places. We're trying to get Shelby into Austin <laughs> if we can. So greatest city. Yeah, I'd really like to be, what was that? What city are you guys in? Well, we're technically in Wayne, Nebraska here at Wayne state, but everybody else is all over Iowa. I'm in, yeah, I'm in Dubuque, Iowa. Okay. Yeah, cool. and, and Rob's from Central Iowa. He's got his sound up, but he's in Central Iowa. Hey, Michael always says I'm from Central Iowa. I'm, I'm from Cedar Rapids, I mean, which is Eastern Iowa. So oh, yes, uh, right. it's, uh, it's more Central. Central it's Central yeah. Eastern Iowa. How dare you, Michael? <laughs> <laughs> I know. And Rob, Rob's in my current film. He's been driving four and five hours to, you know, each week to go ahead and be in my movie right now. So. So I've got, I'm working on, on a feature right now. I'm, I'm stalled though. I'm 50% through then COVID hit. So. So what are you doing? Oh, it's just, it's, you know, well, part of the thing is, cause I'm a professor. They, they expect me to be producing all the time. So yeah. I've got a little, I have, you know, it's my little kind of, um, it, it's a romantic comedy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, um, it's interesting. It's actually kind of based on a friend of mine who is also a film professor uh, he was a widower and um, he ended up, he's 55, fell in love with a 28 year old woman. And it's about what it was like for him to be in love with someone half his age and about how his daughter was the same age as the woman he was in love with. It's, it's, and it's, um, it's, it's interesting. So mm -hmm. it's kind of based on my friend. Cause you know, like you say, write what you know. So I wrote this mm -hmm. based on my, my yeah. dear friend. Oh, that's cool. But you are, you've already shot half of it. It's half <laughs> shot. Yeah. And half cut and half colored. <laughs> Cause we've been, in, we've been in, we've been in, uh, we've been stalled for weeks. So we're hoping to get, you know, get it finished. All the tough stuff's kind of been shot. We've just got mostly, you know, kind of the romantic scenes left. So I, I plan to have it done by fall, but you know how that goes. I mean, who knows? Yeah. This is your Cleopatra. Yeah, yeah, you know how that goes. That is good. Well, um, what's the name of that film? Uh, Vivre de Nouveau. It's got a French title. That's a working title. We're going to have one in English so people would actually want to watch it. So, but... <laughs> well, although people like French stuff or Americans like French stuff, like the uh, one of the marketing guys from one of our films was like, yeah, just throw the Eiffel Tower on there. People, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure. Well, you know. <laughs> My, my family's French, you know, so it was, it, there's a lot of, there's the, the, the character, his, his mother is a French immigrant. So she's this very comical French immigrant mother, mm -hmm. you know, who is, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, I don't know. I mean, it's not like your stuff, Alex, let's put it like that. 
So but, <laughs> I, I, we watch all kinds of stuff. And so yeah. I, I just like people to tell their stories. And yeah, like you say, if it's honest and it, it will be engaging and interesting in some way. Mm -hmm. well, well, what's I, the name of the Elliot Xavier film? I'm hmm? sorry? Elliot and Xavier, the, the characters, so what's the name of the movie? Is that the name of the movie? That's the working title right now. Um, I'd like to think of something more clever and more interesting, but uh, yeah, right now, just the working title is Ellie and Xavier. You know, um, when I was talking about, I call my producer friend, like I call Ann Walker, who's, the, she produced all Brick Link Letters films and they get her advice all the time. Mm. So like when we got to a stopping place, you know, that's just like, who are your film idols? Okay, that have always helped you like, okay, what do you think? What's your advice? And, uh, it was funny because she talked to her kids because our movie's name is called is Alyssa, and then her kids were like, "Nah, I don't like I don't like movies that are named after people." <laughs> okay. There you go. Noted. <laughs> That's funny, Alex. This has been really fun. I, I promise everybody I wouldn't go longer than an hour and a half, but. I, I just wanted to, to tell broken. you how much of a pleasure this is. I've, I've wanted to meet you for over 10 years. So it's just really totally super cool for me. Anytime. And uh, yeah, thanks guys. I hope you go make films and uh, yeah, write me if you have any questions or, or whatever. Great. But really uh, the only thing that's important is that you uh, let the discouragement overwhelm you because you will be discouraged because that's just life as a filmmaker and it will not be, you know, financially uh, great, but persevere, persevere. Even COVID-19, come back and you persevere. <laughs> and I, I know you probably have a lot of people read your stuff, but if you write two words at all, sit, please send it to me. I'd love to read anything you're writing. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see how this new one is. This one has been a really pet project. I'll well, send, send you the one I was going to make, because I, I made a 10-minute animation of the opening of what was going to be my follow-up film called Five Hundred Reasons to Play Yourself. I would absolutely love to read it i would love to read it so yeah please do send it to me i'd, I'd love it and i'll, oh, I'll, I'll be sure it's to all, it's, all it's an animation that's yeah. the thing you look up to show people everything show people show people show people. your yeah. job is done so this is great well this has been wonderful and for the folks that that were here like participating in the zoom thanks for coming and i know i was looking there was a lot a lot of people watching so it was a good day so so, well, man, thanks so much, guys. Go make this was, Thank you. This was really fun. Yeah. All right. Thanks again. All right. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye.